Let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts and our minds to hear the word of God as we say so. So, like I mentioned last week, or I guess the week before, I, I wanted to start a new sermon series on some of the more well-known characters from the Bible. And, and last week, since it was close to Christmas, I started with Joseph. But if, if, if you were here that week, I also uh, sang a song, one of my dad's favorite songs, The Preacher and the Bear. And this is, the song is actually where I got my idea for for this series. And if you remember, the chorus mentions a few characters from the Bible. I was just teaching uh, the kids that song downstairs because I believe that's such a great song it should never fade away into obscurity. In fact, that only Mike Schaus was the only one here that knew it. I'm very concerned about that happening. So I'm teaching that song to a new generation to keep it alive and well in the hearts. But anyway, the chorus goes, uh, Oh Lord, you delivered Daniel from the lion's den. And so I thought that I would start with, uh, with Daniel. And uh, it's a pretty good place to start, very famous character in the Bible. Uh, apparently I like the name Daniel, because we picked it to name our firstborn at 20 minutes, child. So anyway, let's talk a little bit about uh, Daniel today. And I'd like to start off with a little background information and then get into his early life. But uh, when we think of Daniel, we always think of the lion's den. And uh, we're not going to get to the lion's den today, but, um, but it's actually a book about prophecy. And, and the, the, the book of Daniel is about, about the life of, of Daniel, but it's also about the prophecies that he had. And he starts off as a captured Jew that was, that was carried off to Babylon after the conquest of Jerusalem by, um, and this is a name that is not in my um, Microsoft spell check, Nebuchadnezzar. It's a name this long, and I didn't type it out because I didn't have enough room, but Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem in six, 605 BC. And the prophecies in the book of Daniel were so accurate I read an article about uh, uh, Alexander the Great, and it said that when Alexander the Great invaded uh, the Near East, the, the, the high priest went out to meet him, and he showed him a copy of the book of Daniel. And Alexander read it, and he saw himself in it, and he was so impressed by the prophecies that instead of destroying Jerusalem, he went into the temple and, and worship instead. So the prophecies uh, of, of Daniel have been very accurate in the past. And so obviously there's a lot more to Daniel than just the lion's den. Um, so the story begins, like I said, in Jerusalem when, when it falls to the Babylonian Empire um, and the young Israelites that were of noble birth and royal family, and the Bible says, and were without physical defect, and were handsome. So those Israelites were um, picked to serve the new king. And so they were taken away from their home, taken away from Jerusalem, taken to Babylon, to Babylon and they were to be taught the, the literature and the language of, of the new nation. And this included Daniel and three of his uh, companions. And when they got there, they were told that they needed to eat this specific food and, and drink this specific wine. And Daniel uh, and his friends refused to do it. And the, the, the person that was watching them was, was, was very afraid because uh, they weren't following the uh, they weren't following the rules, and Daniel suggested that there be a trial. He said, let me eat my food um, for 10 days, 
And if I come out healthy, then you then you can let me do then you can let me eat what I want. And so for ten days he ate nothing but vegetables and water. And after the ten days he came out healthier than than anybody else. Now I think this was the start of fad diets. Um, because I'm surprised that we don't have a diet now called the Daniel diet. Um, we do? Seriously? No, there you go. Is it really? Yes. Huh, well you can see how much research I did on that. <laughs> really? That's amazing. Because I was going to start, it was like my idea. This is going to be like my million dollar idea. Okay. Well, let me skip that whole paragraph. <laughs> Well, it worked, and he came out happier and healthier and, and everything on the other end. So they um, allowed him to continue to not eat the king's food, and, and, and then later in the story, and that helped, that helped set Daniel on this path to be trusted by, by the king. And when, when Daniel finishes, uh, this, this trial, he becomes trusted, he becomes a trusted advisor, and God would give Daniel insight into, into dreams and visions. And by the end of it, Nebuchadnezzar finds Daniel ten times better, ten times better than all the wise men in his service, and, and he keeps Daniel in his court, and he becomes a trusted advisor. And so this is where Daniel was when he had this this pivotal moment. And we all have pivotal moments in our lives where we make decisions. And these decisions are made at these crucial times. And they're, they're usually um, decisions that, that really set the course for the rest of our lives. And I was trying to think of a real life example of this. Something that, you know, like in, in real life where we've had these situations, and my mind immediately went to Star Wars. Now, it was a pivotal moment, a pivotal moment for Luke when the droid that he was going to buy from the Jawas malfunctioned and, and didn't work anymore, so he had to buy R2-D2. And then he found, of course, the hidden message from Princess Leia, and his destiny was set. And it was a pivotal moment where everything changed for him. From that moment on, everything was different. And then after I thought of that, I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. I need to stop using Star Wars examples because Kyle's the only one that understands them. And so I need to pick something that normal, non-geek people would understand. That's fair. Right. <laughs> And so I thought of another pivotal moment from The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> when Bilbo accidentally finds that magical ring and decides to put it in his pocket, he changed his own course of, of his life. He, his whole destiny changed, and the whole history of Middle Earth changed. And so for Bilbo, that was a pivotal moment as well. So you have two examples of how Normal, real, everyday people like Luke Skywalker and Bilbo Baggins had come to these pivotal moments in their lives. They made a major life decision, and it took them in a completely new direction. And the story of Daniel is God putting Daniel in one of those moments, putting a pivotal moment in front of Daniel, and seeing how Daniel's life, and seeing how Daniel's destiny changed. Daniel was in a crisis, and, and this was his moment. And I'm going to read from the scripture here, but I didn't put the, the verses on the board because it's, they're too long. But this is from Daniel chapter 2, if you want to follow along in, in the Bible. But it's from Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And this is that moment of crisis for Daniel where he has to choose what to do next. And it sets up the rest of his life. This is from Daniel chapter 2. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. 
And when they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. And then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants this dream, and we will interpret it. And the king replied to the astrologers, he said, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards of great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. So basically what he's saying is, if you're so good and if you're so smart, then you tell me what I dreamt, and then interpret it. It continues. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream, then we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time, because you realize this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. And the astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, or enchanter, or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for David and his were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. So the king has really set them up for failure. Not only do they have to interpret the dream, they have to tell them what the dream was. And so he summons all the wise men, including Daniel. And his friends, and he's going to put them to death. And not only put them to death, but have them cut to pieces. And so the scripture I stopped kind of at a cliffhanger. But it's not really, and since it's the only the second chapter of Daniel, and you all know that he later goes to the lion's den and everything else, you know this isn't the end. You know that Daniel and his friends aren't put to death. It's like like seeing a movie trailer that spoils the ending before you see it. We know everything turns out fine. But just imagine for a moment how Daniel felt. He definitely, he definitely felt the suspense. King Nebuchadnezzar is not only demanding the impossible, but he is threatening severe punishment if you don't accomplish the impossible. To Daniel, this looks like a no-win situation. And if you don't come through, the king is going to kill you. Sounds to me like it would be a great time for Daniels to pack up and get out of there. Everybody, I'm sure, is in a panic. And it's time like these when the question comes to mind, I'm sure for Daniel, why me? Why am I in this situation? And I'm sure at least some of his counselors were thinking that. The king's demand was not fair. Yet he had the power to impose it on. Daniel and his companions had just been living their own lives, doing their jobs, when all of a sudden they were hit with this huge dilemma, this huge situation. And so in that situation, Daniel thinking to himself, why me, makes complete sense. And of course, we could blame Nebuchadnezzar for this situation. But then the question remains, where did this dream that he had come from? How did Daniel get to this point anyway? And there are a couple of ways to think about this. Did God set all of this in motion just to get to this point? Did God completely orchestrate every detail of these events to bring Daniel to this pivotal moment? Or did these events play out from free will and God simply put the right people in the right place at the right time. Either way, if you think about it, this was Daniel's moment. We at least know that God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream. And the dream is a picture up here. There's this 
huge statue made of different types of metals and the statue was being destroyed. We often don't think of God being uh, actively involved in people like Nebuchadnezzar. At this point, Nebuchadnezzar was wicked. He was brutal. He was an idol worshiper. We probably don't think of God speaking to people like that. But Daniel says that God gave him this dream. In Psalm 37 it says, The steps of a good man, man are ordered of the Lord. But Nebuchadnezzar was not a good man at this point. So why wouldn't God give a special, like this, a special dream like this to, to some godly person? Someone that follows his will. God's plan for the advancement of his kingdom does not always fit how we think. And we've talked before about expecting the unexpected. We've talked before about always being prepared. And this is why we never know. We never know how God is going to go to work in our lives. I mean, think about the crazy journey that Daniel has had up to this point. Things weren't exactly great for him. His homeland was taken over by an invading army. He was forced to leave, forced to serve another king. And through it all, Daniel made good decisions. Decisions that followed the will of God. And making those decisions did not necessarily lead him to a life of comfort. It did not lead him to a life of ease. It was far from it. Because now he was being threatened to be put to death because of this dream. So we know that the Bible does not say that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. We know that. And we know that it's more complex than that. But even though Daniel and his friends, through, through no fault of their own, are placed in this crisis situation, this pivotal moment, Daniel and his friends were prepared. And that's the important part. They were prepared. And that's the heart of this message. If we don't take God's preparations, then when a crisis comes into our lives, we may make the wrong choices. But Daniel was prepared. He was prepared spiritually to deal with this pivotal moment. He was prepared to deal with this crisis. How do we prepare? How does one prepare for a moment like this? Well, Daniel was prepared because he knew God. He followed his word. He prayed. He had a relationship with God. He was prepared. Anticipating a problem is one of the best skills that we can have. I talk about it constantly with my fourth graders at school. When I teach them how to study for a test, that's exactly how I frame it. You hear me in class, you've done your homework, you know what I think is important. Your job is to anticipate the problems that are going to be on the test. I always hated it when teachers give uh, study guides for tests, which are really just the test with the questions mixed up. To me, that's not a study guide. It takes the opportunity to anticipate problems away from the kid when you do something like that. If you can anticipate the problem, then you are prepared. In life, we know, we know there are going to be problems. We know, and we know they're going to be much more serious than questions on a social studies test. But often we can, we can anticipate them. But there are many times when we can't. But that's why it's so important to be prepared. Because things will come up. Things will surprise us. Things will catch us off guard. And those are the times when it is so important to be prepared. Even when we think we are doing a good job of anticipating, life can still surprise us. I can remember when my grandpa died. We were prepared. 
we anticipated it, we knew that it was coming, and we knew that it wouldn't be long. But when it happened, I was surprised. I was shocked. I didn't think it would happen that day. I thought that I would have more time. But I was prepared even though in the end, I was surprised. And he was prepared too. And the best preparation that we can have is our relationship with God. Our grounding in the Word of God and our faith in His ability to see us through anything. So Daniel was prepared. He was grounded with his faith in God. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the rest of the chapter, but Daniel did not panic. Daniel gave praise to God for revealing to him the dream, and God revealed to him the interpretation. And he went before King Nebuchadnezzar, and he gave him the dream, and he gave him the interpretation. And I will read the end result. That's from chapter 2, verses 47 through 49. It says, The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of kings, and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Since he was prepared for the moment, for he, since he was prepared for that moment of crisis, that moment became a moment of opportunity. And when the king's decree went forth, all the wise men were looking for a place to hide. They wanted to distance themselves from the king. They wanted to get as far away as possible. All they saw was danger. They were running backwards. But Daniel, but Daniel was in a different spirit. Instead of backing off, instead of running away, instead of hiding, he put himself at even more risk. What would have happened if Daniel had missed that opportunity? He stepped forward and he tells the king his dream, tells him the interpretation. What do you think would have happened if Daniel would have given him the wrong dream? doesn't get much worse than being cut into pieces, like the king said. And that would have been a horrible, horrible thing for Daniel. But I don't think that Daniel's courageous act was easy. Even before he heard anything from the Lord, he stepped forward. Before he knew what the dream was, he came <coughs> forward and he said, I can do it. Because he stepped forward in, in faith. He had faith in God. He was essentially telling the king, I can give you the answer. But what if God had not given him the answer? I would have liked to have known the answer before I said that. But that's the difference. Daniel had faith. Daniel knew that God would give him the answer. So how will we, we respond to pivotal moments, those pivotal moments that lay ahead in our lives. It depends on the preparations that you allow God to make right now. It depends on your understanding of God and, and your relationship with Him. It depends on a willingness, a willingness to step forward and trust God for a good outcome even when others cannot see that possibility. Daniel was facing a pivotal moment, but he was prepared. And Daniel's response to that moment propelled him into his destiny for the days ahead. So, regardless of where we are in life, 
and regardless of, of the past decisions that we have made, we can still walk with them, and we can still move forward in a positive way. We all will have an opportunity. We all will have an opportunity of, of a crisis or a pivotal moment like Daniel did. But we must be prepared. And we can continue to prepare. We can continue to prepare by, by growing our relationship with God. And He can help us through whatever crisis or whatever opportunity or hardship that we face. I pray that we are all able to seize that moment and make a positive impact in our own lives and in the lives of others.